can see the speaker. So, uh, welcome to this uh, next session. Uh, our first speaker is Andy Strominger. He will be talking about top-down celestial holograms. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I just like to echo what Alejandra said in her toast last night. It's just so wonderful after three years to be with everybody in, in, in person. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, top-down celestial holograms, and but I'll have one. I'm not going to review the subject of celestial holography. I'm going to have one uh, slide on the on the very basic idea. So um, the very basic idea is that you start with the usual S matrix, usually written in a momentum space basis. And uh, the uh, hypothesis is that this can be described uh, in terms of a uh, celestial conformal field theory that lives on the celestial sphere up at null infinity, where the points of the incoming and outgoing particle become points, their entry or exit points on the celestial sphere. And this takes the form of a uh, correlator in a conformal theory on the sphere. Now, um, in the, why, why would we uh, want to do this? Well, one hope is that this will be the sought after, so we've learned in the last 25 years, uh, an incredible amount about holography and anti de Sitter space, uh, but we don't have a clear idea of what holography in flat space should look like. It's clearly somewhat different. And uh, this is a proposal for the sought after holographic dual representation of, uh, of physics in flat space. Um, and in this holographic dictionary, uh, instead of working on a moment, energy momentum basis over here, we work in a boost weight basis. And since the group, the Lorentz group, SO31 is SL2C, um, that, that corresponds to, that's the conformal group, X as the conformal group on the two sphere, that, uh, that corresponds to working in a conformal basis over here. And so, as I said, SL2C Lorentz becomes global uh, 2D conformal group acting on the celestial sphere. But even better, in quantum gravity, there's a soft theorem, which, as often happens in theory, two-dimensional theories with a global conformal symmetry, the global conformal symmetry can be seen just from the soft theorem to be enhanced to the familiar infinite dimensional local conformal group. And um, so there's something that looks like some kind of conformal field theory, albeit uh, not the usual unitary uh, local variety, and exactly what properties it has is uh, under active uh, investigation. And so far in the subject, most of the work has been simply defining the right-hand side uh, by the left-hand side. So it's a transformation. So it's not a conjecture that you can rewrite uh, the S matrix in um, asymptotically flat space in the form of a collection of correlators uh, in the celestial sphere. It's a quite more a question of what you can learn about doing that, in particular, if you can learn something about flat space holography or even more were also very interesting, um, find some constraints on correlation functions in quantum gravity. Now, there are many different directions uh, under pursuit in this subject, and I'm not going to uh, be reviewing the, them in this talk. I'm just going to be talking about um, one, basically one uh, set of ideas that are being pursued. Now, in the last 25 years, we've learned uh, a lot about top-down holography in string theory leading to anti de Sitter space. And this is a, a subject in which we have uh, an enormous amount 
of mathematical, of precise mathematical control. So we start with strings, uh, then we learn about brains. We, out of brains, we can make black holes. We go near horizon, we, and we get uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence. But we don't expect in this program to get all the way to the real world in the sense of that we find some string theory, in, or at least I don't expect. It's, it isn't a proof that it can't happen. But I don't expect that we're going to um, start with some string theory up in 10 or 11 dimensions and get exactly to the real world. That would amount to, in one fell swoop, um, knowing all the laws of nature down to arbitrary short distances without ever having had to do um, any experiments. Now, of course, it would be fantastic if we, if we did this, um, but it, it doesn't seem like um, the most likely next thing that we're going to achieve. Now, the philosophy of, of celestial holography is rather different. We start with um, the real world. That is the standard model of, of, of GR and um, electroweak and strong interactions. And um, we try to see what we can understand about this picture, just starting from known experimentally verified laws of physics and in the approximation where lambda is zero. Now, uh, the case where lambda is not zero or you have some asymptotically de Sitter space is also a very interesting problem. Uh, it's just not the one uh, I'm addressing here. And it's certainly a very good approximation to the real world to assume that that's zero. Then you learn that the standard Feynman diagrams and so on that you, we've, we've used to describe in great detail and with great excess and agreement between theory and observation um, have some properties that have not been fully some uh, symmetries and some properties whose implicate who aren't even all fully known and whose implications are are are, are not yet understood and um, they uh, and then and then we uh, these the form of these theorems by the way in this uh, on this side the the first step it was identifying the symmetries. And the, the identification of the symmetries was started only in the last five or 10 years for asymptotically flat space, and it's still not completed. We don't know what the symmetries are, the non-trivial symmetries of the standard model of physics and GR are. Um, and then the symmetry strongly suggests that we want to look at this in a, in a conformal basis as an object on the celestial sphere, and we would like to use all this to constrain what kinds of quantum theories of gravity we can have. That's one hope in the field. And there are already hints that um, all everybody in this room has worked on string theory, and probably everybody would agree that string theory has some kind of inevitability to it, which is hard to put your fingers on, and one of the hopes is that we can use some of these ideas to prove that any set of scattering amplitudes have to, in some form or another, resemble those that we get out of string theory. But of course, we don't expect here ever to get to an exact dual representation in the form of a, an exact celestial conformal field theory, because again, that would be tantamount to knowing all the laws of physics down to the Planck scale and beyond. And that is a fabulous goal, but probably not the next thing that we'll accomplish. Okay, so, so, so this has been largely a top-down approach. Uh, so holography is largely a bottom-up approach. Nevertheless, as a guide to understanding what we should encounter in our bottom-up journey, it's interesting to try to fast forward and see if we can construct some toy models of exact celestial holography. And these will be undoubtedly much less rich than the real world, uh, but still it will give us some ideas of what to look, look for um, 
as as we go forward. And it seems that uh, some simple toy models of exact celestial holography, perhaps so, something like, not exactly like, but something like uh, Witten's uh, um, uh, WZW gravity was a toy model for a, a simple a simple toy model of uh, ADS uh, holography uh, long ago. So something in that spirit. Now, um, so uh, th I just have one transparency on this, and um, especially since this is a, a conference on string theory, it's natural to con try to connect so to get some kind of exact celestial holography, it's natural to try to connect to previous work on flat holography. And probably the most outstanding previous attempt um, at constructing a flat a holographic dual pair that was relevant to flat space was the BFSS, the famous Banks, Fischler, Schenker, and Susskind matrix model, which came out way back in 96. What did, and let me remind you briefly what they did. They started out with 11 dimensional M theory, and then they did a null uh, compactification, discrete light cone quantization along a null circle. And uh, that has, uh, if you uh, periodically identify X minus, the momentum must be quantized some integer N, I'm calling capital N. And what BFS showed is that this, the holographic dual of this is a matrix quantum mechanics, N by N matrices of N D zero brains, uh, where the off diagonal elements are strings uh, which connect the, the N squared pairs of, N squared strings which connect the N different D zero brains. And how this works, it's quite a beautiful construction. How this works is the subject of a long lecture. I won't go through it, through it in detail, but it's really the one instance of a flat holography. That and its compactifications, which can go down to, I think, D equals six, but can't reach D equals four. So to start to connect it with the ideas we've been pursuing in celestial holography, um, I just we started we've started at the, and this is work to appear or in progress. Um, we asked the stupidest questions, um, and the first stupid question was: uh, Is there a soft graviton theorem in uh, in in the matrix model? And it's not completely obvious because the soft graviton uh, theorem uh, arises when you take smoothly all in 11. There is a soft graviton theorem. The soft graviton theorem takes the same form in every dimension. And um, there is one in 11 dimensions. But here you see, because of this, DLCQ, we're stuck with having P minus be an integer over R. And in order for this to correspond to some field in the matrix model, that integer should be at least one. And so um, we can't take P minus smoothly to zero. However, um, what we can do, we still have a soft graviton theorem because what we can do is um, we can take P minus equal to, say, one. And then when you construct scattering states of gravitons in, in the BFSS matrix theory, they correspond to N by N blocks, which become widely separated spatially. These blocks, these blocks there's n nine of them corresponding to the nine transverse XIs. I guess I didn't write that anywhere. So there's nine of these N by N matrices uh, that live in zero plus one dimensions. And uh, an asymptotic graviton is an N by N block. And now we insert a little one by one block and that corresponds to a soft graviton. And then the nice things that hap happens is that uh, the soft limit 
it isn't, you don't have to take strictly to zero to get a theorem about the leading behavior. You just have to have the momentum be much less than the momentum of any other particle. And then you have a soft theorem. And so um, we have these n by n blocks. We take the large n limit, which is what you need to recover 11-dimensional m theory. It's the standard, it's not the Atwift large n limit, it's the BFSS large n limit. And in that uh, limit, um, this acts as a, uh, we have a soft graviton theorem. In other words, there's a theorem which tells you precisely the scattering if you add to the, a collection of large, uh, finite momentum gravitons, actually their momentum is of order n, um, uh, one with a momentum of order one, uh, there's a theorem, the soft graviton theorem applies. Now, what happened in ordinary 4D gravity, which we've studied over the last uh, uh, almost decade, is that the soft Graviton theorem, soft photon theorem, it looks a little bit complicated, but you go to a change of basis, you massage things around, so on and so forth, and then it looks like a nice symmetry generated by a current uh, on, on the celestial sphere. And it looks, it can be thought of as a symmetry. The soft theorem is the ward identity of a symmetry. So if there is a, if there is a, uh, Soft graviton theorem, we can ask the question of what symmetry is that theorem award identity? And the answer to that, so this was question zero, the answer of question one is that um, yes, uh, it is related to a symmetry and it's related to a, a certain class of background Ramond Ramond U1 gauge symmetries, which we have specified infinite dimensional class, which we've specified uh, in this work to appear. Now, there are many more questions to be asked here. And ultimately, question N would be, can we recast this as some kind of celestial holography in which, or will it be useful to be recast as, as some kind of celestial holography in which we have a theory which lives not a zero plus one quantum mechanics, but a theory which lives on an eight dimensional sphere. We're not there yet. Okay, but now we turn to something that um, a lot of people have been working on for the last couple of years. And interestingly, different groups of people have been working on it from uh, different, in different fields, from different viewpoints, and a lot of nice things seem to be coming together. And that is to consider some, uh, instead of a very, a very complex theory with many degrees of freedom like string theory, find some very simple theory that, um, that we can control enough that we could, can actually define the two-dimensional conformal field theory that would be dual to the four-dimensional scattering amplitudes. Now, an important constraint on all this, it, is the W symmetries, and I get, but by W symmetry, I mean the loop group of the wedge algebra of W1 plus infinity, which is too much of a mouthful, so I just say W symmetry. And this W symmetry, here's the commutation relations of the W algebra, and in four-dimensional uh, quantum gravity, this algebra is obeyed by certain modes of a soft graviton, which are which we have identified in a completely explicit way. We can write out their wave functions and use the Einstein equation, or in fact, it works in any minimally coupled theory of gravity. And, um, and these appear in a nice form as currents on the celestial sphere. And um, so this, this, the first two, what did that mean? Five minutes. Five minutes left? Yeah. And then five minutes of questions. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, that's not too good. All right. <laughs> 
So, well, this a picture is worth a thousand words, so I can go a little faster. So, um, there's been some beautiful work by this group, Adam Mason and Sharma, and also Costello and Paquette, and also in the Amplitudes community. They all have different forms of this same W1 plus infinity. Um, before this W1 plus infinity was arising in integrable theories, now it's arising in, um, in it's actually a sector of the real world, kind of like a current algebra sector of the real, of the real world. Um, and um, Penrose was the first one to talk about W1 plus infinity, but I don't think he understood the connection between super translations and super rotations, so there's a lot more that we uh, understand about this now. So now we're going to simplify and, um, in order to get something we can solve. And it turns out that self-dual gravity, which you can think of, you can't have self-dual gravity in Minkowski space because the self-duality connection makes it complex, but you can go to Klein space, which is signature two comma two, or you can just regard self-dual gravity, which I think is the more common view, is the study of the, of the scattering of um, positive helicity gravitons only. And amazingly, this was shown by uh, these people uh, 20 years ago, that this self-dual gravity is a, a seemingly fully consistent quantum theory of gravity in four dimensions, whose scattering amplitudes are known. They're extremely complicated. You can write them down in a couple of pages. And they are one loop exact. And so they provide a very interesting kind of toy model for this celestial holography. And we haven't, and you might hope to find the, since the amplitudes are known exactly, you might hope to find the exact celestial dual. We haven't done that. We've broken the da problem down even further. And, but I'm hopeful that in the next few years that the exact uh, two-dimensional celestial conformal field theory that is dual to self-dual gravity can be found in an explicit form. And interestingly, we showed last year that W symmetry, this is, ex is exact, it's exact in this theory, it's exact at the loop level. And as usual, we can simplify it by using Yang-Mills theory as a, um, as a tool. Okay, but now here is one more crucial simplification, and this has been done in parallel in different language by three different groups, by the group at, at Harvard, which is uh, the first people plus uh, Sruthi Narayanan, and by Costello and Paquette, and also by, uh, by uh, Stebert Taylor and Fan Fotopoulos and Jew. Um, and the idea is to break translation invariance. Now, translation invariance as it acts on a conformal field theory is a very weird thing because it, it relates operators of one dimension to operators of one dimension higher. And at first it sounds nice to uh, have so much symmetry, but you quickly realize that that symmetry forces the low point functions to have a singular character, which comes from uh, summing over infinitely many intermediate fields, and if you break this translation invariance, you get theories which are much simpler and more familiar. And um, the, these three groups did this in different ways. The way we did it was we simply coupled self-dual Yang-Mills theory to a Higgs field, and we did that because this, this theory had been studied 10 years ago by the people at Slack, and all the formulas were known. And that Higgs, massive Higgs field has a operator, which is a dimension two operator on the celestial sphere, and therefore you can integrate it, which is the same thing as shadowing it, and that gives you a deformation of the celestial, of the conformal field theory, which breaks translation invariance, but not conformal invariance. And once you break translation invariance, you lose you generically lose the singular behavior of the low point functions. And um, I can't, don't have time to, was that double button? I'm completely out. 
question time. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, this is a calculation here. One nice thing I'd like to highlight is that if you do this, you do this hyperbolic slicing, and if you integrate over the slices first, the Feynman diagrams re reduce to ADS3 Witten diagrams, and so we're getting a very sharp relationship between ADS holography and, and flat holography. And uh, so we look at this Lagrangian, which is kind of like what Costello and Paquette had, but with a different kinetic term, and also like what uh, Fan et al. had. We use this ancient formula, 2004, for one Higgs insertion and a gluon insertion, the this, this single trace diagram. And it's actually much simpler than MHV. It's got nothing in the numerator. And we melon transform it. We're a little, this is in progress. We're a little worried about the regulator we used. Um, and I'm suppressing powers of N and G Yang millions. But basically, this takes uh, the form, the endpoint function of N conformally soft gluons, which generate a current algebra on the celestial sphere, is exactly what you uh, would, would hope it to be. Um, and even even the two point function is is non vanishing and doesn't have that singular delta function. The delta functions in the two, three, and four point function that exist when you that are that can be seen as a simple consequence of translation invariance are gone. So there's a correspondence between the scattering of soft gluons in four dimensions and a uh, with some gauge group G and the current algebra of um, uh, on 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 the celestial of the uh, WZW model uh, on the on the celestial sphere. So this isn't a full celestial. This is a, a, a duality between a portion of one theory and a portion of another theory. It's not a full celestial duality, but I feel we're getting close, and I'm hoping for some more progress soon. A lot more questions. What other operators are there here other than the currents? What looks like, looks like with gravity and so on? And so the conclusion is that an exact quantum gravity uh, on M4, a, a duality relating an exact quantum gravity on M4, albeit a simple one, not the real world, and a, a, a two-dimensional celestial conformal field theory, it seems like something that's within reach. And, uh, and um, especially the uh, long paper of uh, Castello and Paquette has a lot of formulas which they haven't assembled in this way, but uh, may, be, may be very uh, close to this. And there's a lot more computations left to be done to make this, make this sharp. So um, thank you for listening. Yes, uh, Hi, Andy. Are there any vestiges of black holes in this self-dual gravity theory that's one loop exact? Um, yes. So <laughs> it's a very beautiful story. And uh, so... Um, uh, so it's natural to think of it in Klein space in 2-2 signature. Um, we had a paper um, uh, recently um, called Black Holes in Klein Space, in which we did exactly that. So we've learned a mountain by, by taking um, Lorentzian black holes and analytically continuing them to Euclidean space. But the modern amplitudes program really doesn't use Euclidean space. They use Klein space. Their spinners and their conjugates are independent, which in a f which is they don't say it, but th that amounts to saying that they're defining their amplitudes by continuation from Klein space. So, in fact, we have looked at the general problem of black holes in in in, in Klein space, and it seems to be it seems to be a very rich one, and in particular following some things that have done in the amplitudes community, there seems to be some weird state with the property that uh, you can generate all the scattering of the off black holes 
as ma- by matrix elements with that state. And they've been using that um, in uh, for for LIGO computations, actually. So um, there's a formulation of n equals two strings in four dimensions in two two signature. So is there a an n equals two string version of everything you're saying about uh, self dual gravity? Yeah, we spent a lot of time thinking about the end. Andrew Nell Halder and I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the n equals two string, um, and. I think that the n equals two. Um, I mean, first of all, you don't need a string theory if the field theory is already free of UV divergences. This one loop diagram is weirdly UV finite, so you don't need string theory. I think that that, it, and after some conversations with Kumran and a lot of readings, so, um, that I think that. Um, that that theory is really suited for as a kind of topological theory, which you put on different uh, kinds of manifolds, and it diagnoses their 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 topological structure. I don't think it adds much to the subject of of scattering in in um, in asymptotically flat, yeah, in in, in asymptotically flat space. We did spend a lot of time looking at that. I'm I'm happy to talk to you more about it in the break. I do feel that the n equals two strig is is in in our long history of amazing and interesting ideas that uh, that never got uh, pursued quite to the end that it stands very high on that list. <laughs> okay, so I think we can move on with the next speaker. Thank you very much.